Good morning. Great to see the sun shining after some yucky showers that we always need. And thank God my dog didn't keep us up for too long last night. He does not like those thunderstorms and I don't like him barking. So thank God for that. Well, let's all praise God together. We will praise you, Lord, as we gather before you with varied thoughts and purposes. Some of us are doubtful, and we seek further proof of your spiritual power. Some of us are obedient, are disobedient, and we fail to follow in the way of discipleship. Please join us in the hymn of adoration. I know not what God's wonder, I know not why God's wondrous grace.
even now. Despite all interpretation and study, we are so like the disciples of old, unable to contain the fulfillment of the gospel truth. May the Spirit regenerate a new vitality so that we might be living stories of Jesus Christ, unique but united before the world to proclaim good news, the existence of the living Christ. He was sent to save us all and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. At this time, let us all greet each other on this beautiful morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning out there in internet land. Please be seated. Uh, our continuing mission is collecting food for St. Mary's. Uh, they're looking for uh, family-sized products of baked beans and chicken soup, cream of mushroom soup, canned peaches, grits, large peanut butters, large spaghetti sauce, but also very important is their daily needs of toothpaste and shower gels and shampoos. And also, as we can see, we keep collecting Bags of brown bags. Anything else? So side dishes, instant potatoes, rices, things like that. Riceroni, box products that cook fairly easily. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Uh, and also another uh, announcement is our new minister. Uh, in the efforts to find a minister, we have born fruit. Starting on Sunday the 27th, uh, Reverend Deborah Lee will begin serving us uh, as she will with the First Baptist Church in Swansea and us. And much to my dismay, we start at 9 o'clock that morning. But we'll get used to it. We'll all have to wake up a little earlier, but we'll get out earlier and be able to go on with our day. But welcome, Deborah Lee. And on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for the time that I've had. This has been so special for us. Everybody that has preached has served the word of the Lord in very many ways, but it really has hit home for me. It makes me feel very special. Thank you for everybody and the words you claim. And as the last note, uh, after church, Jeff would like to just speak with us all for a couple of minutes um, about some things uh, that we need to talk about with some BBS um, stuff. And also the church. I mean, it's all people. We're all involved in the decisions that have to be made here. So if, if everybody can just stick around for five minutes so Jeff can give us a quick spiel about what we're, gonna, uh, what we're up against over the next couple of months. Is there any other announcements? I said, is there any other announcements? You had an accident? Well, 
Well, we will. You were in the hospital? Ooh. That's a beautiful thing. Praise the Lord for that, that you are here again with us today. Oh, yes, you will. The good lasts forever. <clears throat> Is there any other announcements that we need to cover today? Let us be in the spirit of giving as we give our offerings to the Lord. Gracious God, even in times of hardship, we recognize that you have given us so much to be grateful for. We return these tithes and offerings to you knowing that all we have is ours through grace alone. Even when we have little to give, we possess everything in you. Help us to find ways to be generous every day. Lead, following the lead of your open-handed love, that has withheld nothing from us, may we also not withheld anything from anyone else, and not even your only son. Amen. The hymn of worship is My Faith Has Found a Resting Place, number 287.
Our scripture reading is from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Salvation is for all. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, leading to righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, leading to salvation. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are <coughs> sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Wanda. This text is a well-known passage in which Paul reiterates the very basic and simple structure of one's salvation. He again contrasts what the law says with what the gospel proclaims. Although the word gospel is not used here, while the law says concerning one's righteousness, that the man who does these things will live by them, Paul says that the truth is closer to one's heart and mouth. The word is near you. What follows are three texts that have floated to the top of favorite Pauline dictums, at least from his letter to the Romans. Verses 9 and 10, which offer a form, uh, formulaic DIY approach to salvation, Verse 13, which declares that no one who calls on the Lord will be turned away. And then verse 14 and 15, which affirm the importance of preachers to bring the good news to those who call and believe, even lay preachers. Now let's ponder on this scripture as we enter into a time of silent meditation.
Creator God, the whole universe proclaims your glory. From pebble to star, all that you have made testifies to your power and ingenuity. In a wonder as great as in any creation, you gave to us a share of your inventive powers, allowing us to recreate the world around us. It is an awesome thing that you have given us. This creativity and imagination, so like your own. But we confess, too seldom, do we lift our heads from the daily grind to see what wonders you have made? Let alone envision what, you, what we could be doing with the abilities and resources you have granted us. Inspire us with your Holy Spirit that we may rise up out of the old ruts to glorify you with new songs, new stories, new paintings and sculptures, new inventions and medicines, and new technologies new ways of doing business and practicing law or laying carpet. Inspire us with your sacred imagination that in whatever situation we find ourselves in, we may fully live and stretch our abilities until we become the very people you envisioned with our first breath. Lord, we raise before you the special needs of the shut-in members of our families and our fellowship and our community. Stand close beside the, them amid all unique challenges and frustrations with which they must cope with from month to month, year to year. God, please hold us our prayers and help with all of our troubles as time goes by, but also the salvation of the beauties of our lives and the glorious things that do happen in them. And God, please pray for Deb. Help her through this time. Help her to get healthy. And for Fran, she suffers as the day goes. Please help her to find a little touch of happiness and love. And for Scott and Priscilla, as they are out on a beautiful vacation, help Scott to recharge and Priscilla to become comfortable and relaxed in their time up there. And I'd like to reach out to my two beautiful new nieces. We were born a little bit early. They were born last week, uh, paternal twins. I'm not, I'm sorry, identical twins. Kinsley and Everly. God, put your grace upon them and help them to get through this time while they're still in the hospital and help them to become healthy, beautiful young ladies. And for the family of Chris Cook, a good friend of mine that passed away about a week and a half ago, may they find peace in time of this terrible way. And I'd like to reach out to my nephew John Niles on his birthday today and also to his dad, a heavenly birthday on the 16th. May God's grace be with you. Holy God, we praise into the fabric of our lives so our lives become a blessing to others. We've peace into our words and deeds so hatred and anger are disarmed. We've love into our work so accomplishments are inspired by humility. Weave kindness into our actions so the world becomes a joyous place to live. Weave hope into every encounter so we may testify to God's continuing resurrection. Weave song into our worship so our mornings might echo in praise to God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us in the hymn of petition. Find us faithful. We're going to sing it two times.
Our scripture text today is from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Jesus walks on water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waters because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw them walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind had died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. Do you feel that sometimes your ship's sinking? <laughs> Lots. But most of the time we do try to reach out and have God and Jesus help to carry us through, keep us from sitting so deeply. And the precision of Matthew's gospel reminds us that Christ is here in the boat with us. Today's scripture reading is from the gospel of Matthew. And for the first time, we have seen defensible speculation of what might have been unique about the apostle who wrote the gospel. That, thanks to the video series, and I don't know if anybody has seen it, call it, seen it yet, called The Chosen. You have. We've started watching it. We haven't been able to continue, but it's a really good story. Uh, and it's a very good learning experience for someone that has not really followed Jesus. Uh, which is, as of this writing, has launched its third season. While the series presents some backstory in Jesus' ministry that goes beyond what the four gospel tells, nothing we've seen contradicts the overall story of Jesus from the New Testament. And if nothing else, that show makes Jesus more accessible to today's audiences than any other previous on-screen portrayal of him. Because it does. It, it, it's a good following series. The Gospels don't give us a lot of information about Matthew, except he was a tax collector who got up and left his employment when Jesus called him as, to become a follower. But the writers of The Chosen decided to depict Matthew, played by actor Paras, Paras Patel, as somewhere on the autism spectrum. He has some tics, anxieties, difficulties reading, social cues because sometimes seen in persons with autism. But he's quite able to function in society. He is exceptionally good with figures. He is excellent with memory and very attentive to details. Sort of on a borderline OCD. The writers of the show apparently decide to portray Matthew on the spectrum because the gospel attributed to him is longer and more direct the detail than Mark's and contains minutia such as genealogies. His boss, gospel includes more of what Jesus taught, including the Sermon on the Mount, than does Mark, which was not as explicit, which scholars believe was the first of, four, of the four gospels to be written. Preachers are aware of biblical scholarship that questions whether the apostle Matthew was the actual author of the gospel bearing his name. But the show accepts it, and for our purposes here, we will too. There is a post-ascension scene in one of the episodes of The Chosen 
that shows the Apostle John preparing to write his gospel by making notes and quizzing his disciple colleagues for their memories of their time with Jesus. He's been asking them to tell them what, they, uh, what happened when they first saw Jesus. When he puts that question to Matthew, a former tax collector, Matthew says, hmm, it was the fourth morning of the third week of the month of Adar, sometime around the second hour. So, talk about precise. John says, it doesn't have to be that precise. Why wouldn't it need to be precise, Matthew says. And then, apparently referring to his answer, or perhaps even to the gospel account he is writing, Matthew added, mine will be precise. Our reading today about Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee is a case in point. It is clear that Matthew has Mark's record of the same incident before him as he writes. For there are similar vocabulary in both accounts. But if you know anything about town locations in the Palestines of Jesus' day, it becomes obvious that Mark's account has what might be a geography error regarding where the boat was headed. The upshot is that when meticulous Matthew wrote his version, he corrected that error, fixed it right up. As further evidence of Matthew's precision, his account of the feeding of the 5,000 immediately precedes the Jesus walking on the water story. While the four gospels tell, Jesus, tell of all of Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, Matthew, because of his precision, also adds in, and this is the only story, this is the only gospel that includes it, is besides women and children to the number being fed. Mark and John also narrate the walking on the water story, but it's Matthew who added that Peter, getting out of the boat and attempting to walk to Jesus, Jesus saving Peter when he starts to sink. In addition to this account, Matthew moves it from a wow, Jesus can walk on water amazement, to a story about faith and trust. And only Matthew includes the statement that the waves were battering the boat. That's a clue that there is a deeper story behind the surface one. One of the most common symbols of early church was a boat or ships on the water, and often pictured not on calm water, but on rough seas. In fact, the word nave, which architecturally refers to the main portion of a church's sanctuary, comes from the Latin word nevis, which means ship. So we're all in a ship, which sometimes is on smooth waters, sailing well, but other times our ship does have its rougher seas. As people facing persecution because they were part of the church, Matthew readers understood that their ship, the church, was being battered quite severely. In fact, the original Greek reads that the boat was being tortured by the waves. It can be pretty rough out there. After Peter, after Jesus and Peter get back into the boat, the wind ceases. Matthew says that the disciples worshiped Jesus and said to them, to him, truly you are the son of God. That reaction, however, isn't, is quite different from Mark and John's reports. In Mark, far from declaring Jesus' divine identity and worshiping him, the disciples are described as being astounded and having their hearts hardened, which probably meant their understanding of the meaning of what they had just witnessed. Jesus walking on water was blocked. John's version merely says that they reached the land toward which they were, had been aiming. So even though they were all there, Everybody sees things through different ways. As we read the gospel overall, it's uncertain that the disciples recognized Jesus' identity as the Messiah this early. So it's possible that Matthew, in reporting the disciples worshiping Jesus as the Son of God, 
was drawing something that happened later back into this earlier incident. It is a meticulous Matthew with the 2020 clarity of hindsight is saying to his readers that Jesus is the Son of God is what should be realized after seeing him walk on water. And so that is how I am narrating, na narrating the story now. In doing so, he turns the incident from simply a slice of Jesus' biography into a story meant to encourage persecuted Christians to cling to Jesus as Lord, despite the hardships they are facing. That does not make Matthew a bad historian. It makes him a good preacher, for his purpose in writing was not to be a biographer of Jesus or a historian of Christianity, but an evangelist for Jesus and the gospel. But since Matthew had given us a fuller account, let's look at these two who walked on water early, in the mo early that morning. Here were, two dis were the disciples out to sea in more ways than one, sort of like up the creek without a paddle, with the wind blowing against them and waves battering the boat. At this point, Matthew says nothing about them being afraid. In fact, some of them at least were a seasoned fisherman, and being out on rough waters was very normal to them. It was sort of par for the course, their daily way. As long as they stayed in the boat and worked together with the sails and the rudder and the oars, they had a reasonable chance of coming through the storm without too much damage. They used all their tools to get to where they needed to be. What scares the wits out of them is seeing somebody walk on water. I would say so. And their first thought is that they were seeing a ghost. Whoa. But then Jesus spoke to them. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. All three of the gospel writers who record this incident agree on this point. What Jesus said is translated into English as, it is I. In the Greek, however, what Jesus said was, ego, imi, which is, I am. So what he said was, take heart, I am, do not be afraid. I am is the name God gave himself. When, from the burning bush, God called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Moses asked God how to identify his fellow Hebrews this God was speaking to him about. And God responded, I am, which comes from Exodus 3.14. In quoting what Jesus said to the disciples, all three gospel writers were acknowledging something about Jesus' divinity. Only in Matthew's version, though, however, did the disciples seem to pick up on it, worshiping him as the Son of God. But now, there is the other water walker, Peter. In Matthew, it is not Jesus who introduces the idea of Peter walking on the water. It's Peter that says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water. In response, Jesus says, come, giving Peter permission, but not pushing him. That's an important difference for a while. There is some faith involved in Peter's attempt to treat the water as solid ground. There is also a bit of skepticism. Is this really him? Peter is saying, in effect, if it's really you, Jesus, make me able to walk on water. Prove that you truly are Jesus. In other words, if Peter's faith were stronger, he would have stayed in the boat and believed it was Jesus who was coming to him instead of testing the waters. If we want to discover any message for ourselves in this story, it isn't if we had enough faith 
will, be, will we be able to do as miraculous as Jesus did? No. Instead, it's believing that despite the battering of our own lives, take in how much deep water we find ourselves in, Christ comes to us in our daily lives as we live as part of a worshiping community like our family here. Don't we sometimes feel as if we are living in a storm where navigation is risky and trouble comes in waves? In such times, the last thing we may expect is to see Jesus coming towards us. Even if we sense what might be his presence, we may, like Peter, want to ask him if it's really him. Let us miraculously walk away from our problems. We seldom get that kind of solution, however. Matthew the Meticulous might tell us it's better to ask Christ to join us on our shaky crafts on our stormy seas of life. If we trust him to sail with us and show us how to deal with the waves that batter our ship, he'll help us find land and safely land on heavenly's shore. Amen. Please join us in our hymn of benediction. I know of a name, number 92.
In case no one warned you before, you became part of a community of faith. Or before you opened the Bible, or before you committed yourself to follow, the path of discipleship is not always easy. Jesus' demands often confuse and disturb our normal ways of doing things. May God give us strength for our journey, for your journey, wisdom for your decision, and love for your companions this day and always. Amen. Thank you.